One challenge of this chapter is that it features two very similar looking and very similar sounding models, two very important models. We have to keep them separate. These old exam questions show you that. For instance, this first one asks about the supplier preferencing model. Oh, okay, what are these two very similar looking and very similar sounding models? There is the supplier positioning model. Let's see if I can get that going under the camera. The supplier positioning model, this four box matrix for classification, is meant to be used to classify supplies, your supplies. You're classifying your own supplies. As opposed to the supplier preferencing model, see I just turned the page, very similar looking four box model. This is meant for classifying potential suppliers, suppliers, people you might do business with. Now, so first off, this particular first question, notice what was underlined, it's asking about supplier preferencing. You say, okay, so this is about that model that helps us classify the potential attitude that a supplier might cop towards us. That's how I remember the supplier preferencing model. What does it ask? This model clarifies how each supplier in the marketplace might view the purchasing opportunity being analyzed by the user of the model. That's us right here. So it's potential suppliers that are being classified. That is what I just described. That is exactly what the model is used for. Okay, this model indicates that if the value of the potential business is high, okay, but the attractiveness of the account is otherwise low, the supplier will simply consider the business a nuisance and not likely to answer any invitation to bid. Uh, all right, now this is referring to, you know, what's the meaning of the two axes on the supplier preferencing model? The value of the business. That's the horizontal one, meaning, you know, the, the amount of money that you're thinking about spending, is it very valuable to them or not so valuable to them? Are you a big potential client or a little one? Okay, so it's saying that you're over here because the value of business is high, but attractiveness of the account, the attractiveness of the account is low. That's what the statement is saying. And you say, well, how, if you're going to spend lots of money, could the attractiveness of your account be low? There must be some other reason. Maybe they consider you to be really annoying. Well, I mean, more practically, maybe you're outside their service area. So while you're talking about spending a lot of money with them, it would be a big hassle for them to keep you as an account because they don't normally work in that city, that type of thing. Okay, so now it was saying that if these two conditions were true, meaning you're in this sector right here, that they'd consider you a nuisance and they were not likely to even answer your phone calls. No, wait a minute, that's over here. That's the same thing if you're not an attractive account, but you're also not talking about spending a lot of money. No, 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 that statement's false because if you were talking about spending a lot of money, but you're otherwise not an attractive account, they would consider you exploitable. They would give you a big number in terms of their price and just to see if you would take it. They don't really care if they lose the bid. All right, now, third statement. If a supplier considers the value of the business to be high, oh, that's nice. It says this here where it didn't before, x-axis and y-axis, that same supplier will always consider the account to be highly attractive. This is just nonsense. We were just talking about why. Right? You could be very attractive in terms of the value of your business. I should clarify that. You could be talking about spending a lot of money, but still not be an attractive account for other reasons. And you're like, oh, no, you wouldn't be worth it as a client. Okay, so those two things do not necessarily travel together. Talking about very lot of business and also talking about being an attractive account. All right, so the only thing here that has tested true is that first statement, so that would have been partial credit. Now this second question is the only question in the set that doesn't have to do with either the supplier positioning or preferencing model. It's got to do with the supply chain terminology. Let's look at it. Okay, Mega Mart sells groceries and other consumer goods through its national chain of big box stores, so they are a retailer 
At the end of the supply chain, Megamart has just learned the government inspectors have found horse meat in boxes of frozen entrees labeled 100% beef at two dozen Megamart stores. Okay, so this is a problem. These frozen entrees were manufactured and distributed by Yummy Foods, who protest that the meat used was guaranteed 100% beef by, look at all the different actors here, Delmino Wholesale, from whom Yummy from whom Yummy purchases this ingredient, and Delmino uh, blames the meat packing conglomerate Southern Star Enterprises, with whom it holds a contract for all its frozen beef and Southern Star Enterprise, and it's insisted did not knowingly supply horse meat in place of beef, indicating the mystique may have been committed by there's yet another actor in here, DRX, the contractor who handles both shipping and warehousing for Southern Star Enterprises, who owns no assets that are not directly related to meat processing. Oh, and then there's a series of statements about this supply chain. Okay, the best, the absolute best way to answer this question is to draw the supply chain instead of trying to review the paragraph back and forth to test the statements true or false, draw a diagram of the supply chain. Okay, how do these actors, what's been described, fit together? Now first off, Megamart. Megamart should be easy. Megamart's over here on the right. Big box stores, they're the retailer. The only other thing here is the consumer. Okay, so they are the near end. I mean, here's your end consumer here. They're the near end of the supply chain. Now, basically it's backing up because they're placing blame, right? Okay, da 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 da. Who did they blame? Manufactured and distributed by Yummy Foods. So Megamart was pointing fingers at Yummy Foods because that's where they get the entrees. Okay, now backing up Yummy Foods was pointing fingers at the protests of meat use was guaranteed by Delmo Wholesale. Okay, that's where they got the meat. Okay, let's see from whom they purchased that ingredient. Delmo blames the meat packing conglomerate. They're just a wholesaler for meat. Southern Star Enterprises is the meat packer. And then Southern Star Enterprises says, no, 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 it wasn't us, it was DRX. Now, you might be tempted to say, okay, yeah, I get it, and then DRX. No, 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 this is, this is the one thing that you have to look at carefully. Uh, they are saying that it was committed by DRX. Is DRX a supplier of Southern Star, well, in a certain sense, but they don't supply cows, right? What did they supply? They are a contractor that handles both shipping and warehousing who owns no assets. Southern Star Enterprise owns no assets, not directly related to meat processing. That's all they do here. I've got to kind of draw over the paragraph, but they just described a third party logistical 3PL provider and that's really kind of graphically what's going on DRX is not actually one of these boxes I just drew a box around it it's actually in a certain sense of that arrow right there they're the logistics provider in that link okay now anyway what are the questions we're supposed to ask which of the following statements are true about this paragraph I'd rather work with this illustration. Delmo Wholesale is a tier two supplier of Megamart. So I find Megamart, right? Tier two means that from Megamart's perspective, Yummy Foods is tier one, Delmo is tier two. Yes, that is true. Southern Star Enterprises is a third party logistics provider. We were just discussing that, but we were discussing it's DRX that's the third party provider. They said Southern Star does nothing but meat packing. Yummy Foods is upstream of Delmo, Delmino, Delmino Wholesale. All right, Yummy Foods, where are they? Upstream is away from the end consumer. Downstream is towards the end consumer. Delmino Wholesale is on this side, so that is true. They are upstream of, wait a minute, Yummy Foods, oh, excuse me, duh, Delmino Wholesale is here, Yummy Foods is downstream, that's false. Yummy Foods is upstream of Delmino Wholesale. This is whose perspective it is. They're definitely downstream because they are between Delmino and the consumer. Sorry about that. That is false. 
So that's the only thing that tested true. There, that sorts that one. Now, back to our little discussion about the supplier positioning versus the supplier preferencing model. The supplier preferencing model, okay, we'll the question on that, you're classifying suppliers. The supplier positioning model, you're classifying your own expenditures. That's what the rest of these questions are about. Let's look. Pegasus Veterinary Hospital is a partnership of five veterinarian surgeons who specialize in treating horses. Okay, PVH is located in a $25 million facility, 20 acres of land, that's nice, employing over 40 full-time staff. So, okay, so they're a small, big small business. The business manager of PVH has conducted the following spend analysis, that's a good keyword like from this chapter, of last year's purchasing. So, of all the various things that they spent money on, you know, other than payroll stuff that they bought, he has or she has gathered them together into these categories. This is how much, and this is nice right here, gives us a sense of scale. Notice that over half the spending was on surgical supplies and pharmaceuticals. I'm just looking at the data, and only a relatively tiny amount of it was on what is this one right here, commercial horse grade supplies, not including hay and grain. Okay, at, well this would make sense. I mean, they're keeping horses. Another major spending category is hay and grain. That's what they eat. Now, PVH's approach to purchasing in each of these five categories has always been the same. But the business manager su suspects that PVH could benefit from some more sophisticated approach. And we were learning more sophisticated approaches in this chapter. Recognizing some key differences between the categories. As an example, surgical supplies. Okay, now I'm being told pieces of information about the different categories. So I better tune in. Surgical supplies and pharmaceuticals are critical to the care that PVH provides and most of these items are highly specialized to the treatment of horses and not easily located on short notice. Okay, hay and grain in contrast can be purchased from a variety of vendors for immediate delivery. I mean, just pick up the phone and you can have some more. Veterinary grade horse supplies are available from several national suppliers who offer overnight shipping. That's nice. Making this category purchasing only slightly less convenient than commercial grade horse supplies, which can be bought at any one of a dozen nearby uh, farms and pet stores. Okay, horse transportation services is surprisingly problematic category of expense problematic considering how little they spend on this category. Most of PVH clients prefer to transport their horses to and from the facility themselves to avoid the additional expense of being billed by PVH for transportation. Occasionally, however, a PVH client will request that PVH provide transportation as well as treatment for a horse, meaning the PVH must then hire the transportation service. While PVH is not a frequent user of this service, it must be able to hire transportation for sick or injured horses on very short notice. So that's very very, very tricky. It's very problematic. They have to be careful about that. Okay, fine. Like, what am I supposed to do with all this? Please answer the following three questions that are on the next page. Assuming the business manager, this is that other model, wants to apply the more sophisticated approach, the supplier positioning matrix. Now, let's see if I can drag the book into this. The supplier positioning matrix. Okay. This is it, looks similar to the last one. This is for classifying supplies though. Okay, classifying supplies based on, now what are the two things that need to be weighed simultaneously to find a spot or a category? The annual expense, how much you, expend, you, you yourself spend on the supply versus the supply vulnerability, the risk. Uh, how easy is it to get this stuff? Uh, how fast would you be brought to a stop if you suddenly ran out? Uh, those kind of considerations. Now, what we're being asked to do essentially, if you look, spy at the questions, which category would PVH likely consider core to its business? It's asking us to take all those things that were mentioned and to basically position them here because the one that's core to the business is strategic critical, meaning it landed up in this sector right here. You know what? I need a little bit of scratch paper because I need a 
fresh matrix. I don't want to keep dragging the book back and forth. Maybe it can make straighter lines. Now, this was annual expense. Just say dollars, lots, or little. This here, vulnerability or risk. Now notice this one ends in high here and low here to get the whole thing to work. Okay, now that first question is asking, who of those five landed in here? Okay, that means that PVH spends a lot and this is a risky type of supply. It's not easy to get a hold of. If we were to suddenly run out, it would bring everything to a stop. It would be really, really bad. No? First off, over on this side, who do they spend lots and lots of money on? Well, they spend lots and lots of money on surgical supplies and pharmaceuticals. Okay, I'm drawn to that 52% of all of this over half. Although, you know, I can't discount, that's a lot too, that they spend on what's that hay and grain, the 31%. So I already have two basic candidates for that block, but I need to know about risk in order to actually place them here. So you know, I don't know how risky, oh wait, they, they started talking about surgical supplies. For example, surgical supplies and pharmaceuticals are critical to the care that they provide, highly specialized, that is another sort of high risk type thing, not easily located, this is all high risk, high risk type things. Surgical supplies definitely in that category. Now, is hay and grain also there? Notice that they contrast hay and grain. Hay and grain, in contrast, can be purchased from a variety of vendors for immediate delivery. That is a good description of anything that's low risk. There's lots of places you can get it, right? And you can get it immediately. Okay, so that means that hay and grain would be in the same column, but it would be down here in this sector. So, we at least have our answer for Three. Now, why did I not immediately test these other two? Because the spending on the other, or excuse me, the other three in the middle, right, this one, this one, and this one, the spending was lower. Okay, now, in which category should PVH focus most strongly on competitive bidding and award its business based on the lowest cost bid, viewing these purchases as tactical decisions only? Which sector is that? First off, the sector in which you focus on competitive bidding, or that would be the most appropriate if you're going to do that, is this sector right here. I am dragging the book back. The tactical profit sector, right? The reasoning being is this is the type of supplies that you spend a lot of money, right? So you yourself, you're probably going to be an attractive customer, but you can get it a lot of different places. So, since you can get to a lot of different places, that's where you're tempted to you know, put it out for competitive bids, see if you can get the best price. Oh, and I already wrote something. And this is what's nice. I already wrote something there. I wrote hay and grain. Yeah. You say, well, don't you have to test the other ones? The other ones, their spending is so much markedly lower, they do belong on this diagram, but they belong over here already. So, if I was in a hurry, I could actually proceed on to the next question. If petty cash were used for any of this purchasing, it would be most appropriate in which category? All right, now we're not necessarily saying that getting into the petty cash habit is a good thing. But if you're going to just use a cash box and just run out and get stuff as you need it and otherwise really not worry about it, it would be most appropriate if it was here, tactical acquisition. Why? Because we're not talking about a lot of money, right? We're on the low expense side. And we're not talking about a lot of risk either. You can be sort of 
I don't want to say careless, but you can concentrate your thoughts elsewhere and just pick this stuff up as you need it. Okay, but what is it that's actually in of the things that were mentioned, this category? Well, we were remarking that you can place the other three, you know, if you want to complete the diagram, or I should say complete the classification for them. The other three, arguably, because the distance between these percents belongs in this category, the question is just which row? Um, hmm, risk. Let's see, what did they say about, for instance, horse transportation services? That's low spending. Do you remember horse transportation services down here? They said it's surprisingly problematic, right? So yeah, horse transport are surprisingly problematic category. Uh, oh, because they aren't a free they aren't a frequent user of transportation services, but they are hiring for the transportation of sick or injured animals and need somebody to answer on very, very short notice. This is all indicating high risk, right? You don't want to use just any supplier and you may need things in a jam. You may need them on short notice. You've got to have it when you do need it transportation for this particular firm is a good example of not being in the tactical acquisition category. It's in the strategic security category up here. Oh, okay, meaning that not only is it now classified, it's not an option to answer that one question about petty cash we're talking about. What about commercial horse supplies not including hay and grain? Commercial horse supplies not including hay and grain? Commercial horse supplies not including hay and grain. Let's see, veterinary grade horse supplies are available from several national suppliers who offer overnight shipping, making this category only slightly less convenient than commercial horse grade supplies. Commercial horse grade supplies, you say, oh, all right. Commercial horse grade supplies and veterinary grade, they look like they're both very, very, very convenient. I'm looking for anything that I might call it like high risk. Right? And I, I'm not seeing it here. They're saying there's many different suppliers. They're saying that veterinary grade is only slightly less convenient, but you can still um, get it from several suppliers. I am tempted to put them both here. Although veterinary grade is slightly less convenient, so it's slightly higher risk, and commercial grade is you can, oh, commercial grade, notice this, you can run to the store, that's what they're saying, and get that stuff nearby PVH versus veterinary grade, you can get it overnighted, but you are ordering away. Oh, but basically I've located two things in this that I said is a candidate for petty cash. I can only answer one of them. That means one of them's the best answer. Well, which one do they spend the less money on that would be the 2% that belongs to the commercial. Oh, I'm psyched. They spend the less money on that. They, you know, petty cash, you want to keep this, keep this to be infrequent. They also are slightly more convenient, meaning slightly lower. That makes them better. They're also local versus you do have to uh, order away for it. That's what makes them, of the two things in this sector, essentially the best answer commercial okay or C although truthfully you know in its day the veterinary grade was partial credit it is in that same sector that wouldn't be of the three the most appropriate one if it's appropriate at all to be using petty cash okay then next question oh phew next question is just definitional which of the following are true a sales rep has greater authority than a sales agent. Let's see if I can spot this in the book. Spend analysis, sales rep, sales agent. Who would have the most authority? Oh man, here we go. There's a whole stack of key terms in this particular chapter. Sales, sales agent. A person empowered 
to bind a selling organization to a contract. Sales rep, a person who solicits orders but cannot bind. Notice there's a privilege and then this one doesn't have a privilege. A sales rep has less authority. There is less that they can do. This has to be false. If you're talking to a sales rep, the only thing they can do is take your order. They're still going to have to go to the sales agent, whether that's their job title or not. The one person in the organization and say, okay, sign it or approve it. We're selling it to you for that price. All right, now, a consumer of a product is downstream from the product's manufacturer. The consumer is downstream from the manufacturer. That is true. That's the meaning of downstream, to be closer to the consumer. A tender is a bid or cost provided to a potential buyer. That is true. You know, that is not a common use in conversation of the word tender, but that is a very common use of that term in purchasing to tender. A tender is a bid. Okay, so what at the bottom two tested true, which means that's partial credit. Oh man, there's lots of partial credit winners here, which finishes up this set.